what is the sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value. Otherwise, you'll be going back to number one, square zero. <clears throat> so <clears throat> let's take a look at the lungs. When you look at the lungs, the markings that you see are primarily due to the blood vessels. Don't call them bronchovascular markings. You are seeing the pulmonary vascular bed directly. These are primarily due to the pulmonary arterial system. When you go to the inner lung zone, there's a little contribution from the pulmonary vein and the bronchus. And when you look at the lung, don't look at them from the point of view of anatomy, look at them from the point of view of hemodynamic correlations as well as clinical correlations. When you look at the lung from the apex down to the base, that is, I'm referring to an upright film, you would see in here, in this pulmonary arteriogram, that the blood flow increases from the apex down to the base. And how do we know the blood flow? When you look at the lower lung zone, there are more blood vessels. Number two, when you look at the blood vessels, the size is bigger. And then number three, when you look at the background, the background of the lung is due to microcirculation. The more white it is, there is more blood flow. The, bl the blacker it is, there is less blood flow. Then when you go up to the inner lung zone, you would see that the blood vessels are less in number. The blood vessels are smaller in caliber. At the same time, you look at the background, the background is more black. And now transfer that concept into the chest radiograph. You would see in here that the markings are more. In the lower lung zone, and in the upper lung zone, the markings are less. And at the same time, the, the size of the blood vessels that you can identify are smaller in caliber compared to the lower lung zone. And what is the reason for this? This was a classic experiment in the 1960s by the group of West. What they did, they did experiments with a dog. I don't know if animal rights was very active at that point. It was in the 1960s. So they cannulated the dog. They, they, they get that chest radiograph in an upright, in an upright view, meaning the, the head of the dog is the one on top. They were able to see that the blood flow is more on the, on the base. And now they inverted the dog and now the head is down, and they see that the blood flow increases now to the apex, and they concluded from the experiment that blood flow in the lung is dependent on hydrostatic pressure. So in an upright film, there are three zones in the lung. Upper zone is zone one, middle lung zone is zone two, uh, <coughs> the lower lung zone is zone three. So as you go from apex to down to the base, there is increasing hydrostatic pressure. Do you know that when you go and dive into the swimming pool, the pressure becomes uh, you, could, you, could, you could perceive that the pressure increases as you go down to the bottom of the swimming pool. Similarly, hydrostatic pressure in the lung also increases from the apex down to the base. And there are three pressures in the lung, alveolar pre uh, arterial pressure, venous pressure, and alveolar pressure. When you go to zone three, where the hydrostatic pressure is highest, what you see in here now is that surrounding alveolar pressure is less. So the arterial end and the venous end are open, and therefore there's more blood flow. When you go up to zone two, you would see in here that arterial pressure is still the highest, but take note that as you go into the middle lung zone, the hydrostatic pressure now diminishes. So much so that the alveolar pressure now is more, relatively more than the venous pressure. So at this point, there is compression at the venous end. Correspondingly, there will be less blood flow. And finally, when you go up into zone one, hydrostatic pressure now is the lowest. You would see in here, relatively speaking, now the alveolar pressure now is highest, followed by arterial pressure, followed by the venous pressure. And what is the consequence of this? Blood flow is least in zone one. So you would see in here, blood flow is more, lower lung zone, blood flow is less in the upper lung zone. Take note of this because there will be alterations of this when you detect congestive heart failure, what we call upper lung zone redistribution. So let's take a look at the pathophysiology of heart failure. What is the, what is the common de denominator of heart failure? It's pulmonary venous hypertension. So at the venous end, the pressure is high. So what happens now when you have blood flow flowing in the microcirculation, there will be high pressure in here. So in Starling's mechanism, there will be ultrafiltration of blood. And they go into the interstitium. There are two types of interstitium. One, what we call the thin interstitium. At this point, there is direct contact between the alveolar lining and the capillary lining. So there is direct O2 exchange. There is no intervening structure. 
On the other side, called the thick side of the interstitium, the alveolar compartment is separated from the capillary unit by a thick interstitium. So edema fluid forms in this region. And this is a safety mechanism the way we are created. Why? You've been seeing a lot of white out in the lungs, and yet there is still maintained autosaturation. Why? Because there is that thin side of the interstitium where O2 exchange is still occur. Even with the full-blown interstitial edema or alveolar edema, we have the thin zone as a safety factor for you to have oxygenation. Let's take a look at heart failure. The common denominator is pulmonary venous hypertension. What are the causes of this one? Let's trace the heart backwards. Pulmonary vein, anything that would occlude the pulmonary vein, like venoocclusive disease, primary pulmonary hypertension, like venoocclusive disease, anything that would increase the left atrial pressure, it could be a thrombus, it could be a LA myxoma, it could be mitral stenosis, it could be mitral regards, anything that would make the LV dysfunction, it could be aortic re, uh, stenosis, aortic rigors, or uncontrolled systemic hypertension. The common denominator of this is pulmonary venous hypertension. Let's, let, let's take a look at now the circulation. Because of the disturbance of the Stirling's mechanism, there will be filtration to the lung microvessel. They will find their way into the perimicrovascular interstitium. Finally, they will go to the juxtalveolar interstitium. They will follow the peribronchovascular interstitium then they will go into the pleura. And what is the significance of this? Before you label the pleural effusion as something related to congestive heart failure, there should be evidence of pulmonary congestion. Because before the, before the edema fluid could reach the pleura, it has to pass through the perimicrovascular interstitium, it has to pass through the juxtalveolar interstitium, it has to pass through the peribronchovascular interstitium. So don't call it related to congestive heart failure and you see, unless you see a background of pulmonary venous congestion and hypertension. Yes? How long is this process from the interstitial? <clears throat> we don't know, but uh, it has been studied that there is a 12-hour diagnostic log, meaning we have derangement of hemodynamics and yet the chest radiograph will show only after 12 hours. And similarly, this is also what you call therapeutic log. You give diuretics, you give cardiotonics, there's improvement clinically and yet you see the chest radiograph is still wet. There is a, there is, it takes time for the edema fluid to be mobilized. They call it therapeutic log. As, as long as 24, uh, 12, uh, 12 hours. And then for a time, <clears throat> the lymphatic system could compensate. But it will reach a point what we call interstitial tamponade. The pressure now becomes positive. And another safety mechanism for, for, make, uh, for making the, uh, the air, uh, for making the airspace dry, alveolar unit dry, is that there are tight junctions in the interstitium. Because of this interstitial tamponade, the pressure becomes positive because normally interstitium should be negative. Because of the positive pressure, the tight junction in between the alveolar units become stretched. And now what happens now? There will be alveolar edema. So this is the progression of edema in cardiac failure. It is predictable. You can follow it. So <clears throat> let's take a look at the fluid now. We have isolated here a one uh, alveolar unit. Interlaced with it, around it is the capillary system. And interlaced with the capillary system is the interstitium. So what happens now? If you form edema, they will go around the juxta alveolar interstitium, and they will find their way into the, the peribronchovascular sheath, and then finally they find their way into the hilum. There is central migration of edema fluid in cardiac failure, why? There is more compliance of the lung in the inner lung zone. So the movement of fluid will be an area of more, uh, yeah, to the area of more compliance. And then finally, the rest of the interstitium will be filled up. There's a reason why you see curly A lines, curly B lines, curly C lines, all of these lines that we call A, B, C, D. These are just edema fluid in the interstitium. So let's take a look at the alveolar unit. This is the interstitium. In here, you would see that the interstitium follows and covers the alveolar unit. Not only that, they will also follow the course of the, the bronchus and the artery, and they also follow the course of the, the vein. And for that reason, when you develop congestion related to heart failure, 
there will be blurring of the margin of the blood vessel. You should look for clarity of the margin of the blood vessel. Not only that, you should also see evidence of peribronchial coughing, C-U-F-F-I-N-G. There will be thickening. You will see the bronchus, because normally you don't see the bronchus. Once you see edema fluid, you will see hollow circles corresponding to the bronchus and the edema fluid surrounding the bronchus. And <clears throat> what are the consequences of this? As you develop interstitial edema, because of gravitational uh, distribution, they will go into the lower lung zone, and they will cause these three effects. There will be an atomic compression of the lower, lower lung zone blood vessel. And because of that, there will be higher resistance in here, blood flow will distribute into the upper lung zone. Upper lung zone will be less resistance. And then number two, the interstitial pressure here becomes less negative or positive. And therefore, the distending effect of the interstitium around the, around the blood vessels is lost, and therefore the blood vessels will be compressed. And in addition to that, because of the fluid surrounding <coughs> the uh, area in here, there will be local hypoxia. And local hypoxia, what is the response of the lung to local hypoxia, is reflex vasoconstriction. All of these things, the three, the net effect will be redistribution of blood flow to the upper lung zone. So you started with more blood flow, normal, more blood flow in the lower lung zone, and now you're shifting the blood flow to the upper lung zone. That is the telltale sign of left-sided heart failure. So you see this one? Look at the blood flow. Redistribution of blood flow in the upper lungs, redistribution of blood flow in the upper lungs. You see interstitial edema in the lower lung zone. You see a more severe one? Don't mistake the edema fluid with the pulmonary blood flow. The pulmonary blood flow is the pulmonary arterial, arterial markings that you see. In here, a lot of edema. But when you see the blood flow, there are more blood flow going into the upper lungs of redistribution plus the evidence of severe interstitial edema. So let's, let's follow the edema fluid. So initially, there will be redistribution of blood flow. In here, there's no sonal distribution of blood flow. When you, when, when you divide the lung into two, you will see that the blood flow is equal in the lower lung zone and in the upper lung zone. This is grade one redistribution. With progression, you will see obscuration of the blood vessels. You don't see it clearly. With progression, you will see more obliteration of the margins of the blood vessel. Remember that the interstitial follows the course of the blood vessel, so they will render the margins of the pulmonary, uh, the pulmonary arterial markings indistinct. And then, much more so with this one, this is a severe interstitial edema. This is alveolar edema. So blurring of the hilum, central migration of edema fluid, and then later on they will progressively fill up the rest of the interstitium. And then finally, go into the stage of combined interstitial and alveolar edema. You would see in here that if you see through the lung edema, you would see a distribution of blood flow into the upper lung zone, a distribution of blood flow into the upper lung zone. Yeah. Okay. I would like to <coughs> this this because I think it's traditional in the old recall. I think it's uh, at what point will you expect interstitial edema? So I think something like a means PCWP of about 25 to 35. It, it's been all, uh, the old recalls in the past, so it's, 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 uh, it's a recurring question in the, in, in the board a written test. So <clears throat> the normal uh, a PCWP, a pulmonary capillary wet pressure, is 5 to 10 millimeters mercury. You have plus 1 redistribution is equivalent to 10 to 15, a plus 2 it is equivalent to 15 to 25, a plus 3 it is equivalent to 25 to 35, and a plus 4 is more than 35. This is an old publication. You can, yeah, this is a very good, yeah, this is a very good one. And hemodynamic correlation, this radiograph, I think still available. You can download it free. It's a 1972, when AGR was still called AJR, RT, uh, they, they combat ray, uh, uh, radiotherapy and uh, nuclear medicine. So this is grade one redistribution. When you look at the sonal blood flow, there is no more preferential blood flow into the lower lung zone. It's equalization of blood flow. The blood flow in here, is similar to the blood flow in the lower lung zone. When you see this, it's equivalent to 10 to 15 millimeters mercury of left atrial pressure or PCWP. As you progress to grade two, there is now inversion of blood flow. The blood flow now becomes more in the upper lung zone. Look at this one, more blood flow, less blood flow. And this is equivalent to 15 to 25 millimeters mercury. Yes? 
Yes, it has to be a red. For you to physiological and he would uh, interpret the, the radiograph, it should be a red. And if you want to make use of ICU, uh, ICU test radiograph, insist on them that 45 degrees body elevation, not so fine. Because the solar distribution of blood flow in the lungs is dependent on differences in hydrostatic pressure. Because a 45 degree uh, film is more informative than a totally supine film. And then uh, progressing on to uh, grade three, when the uh, uh, LAP or PCWP progresses to 25 to 35, you will see combination of redistribution of blood flow plus the evidence of interstitial edema, obscuration of the margins of the blood vessels. And then these are curly lines. It's non-specific, but if you see them, there are no other causes of uh, curly, uh, the other causes of curly B lines. They are seen in chronic congestive heart failure. These are fine lines that are perpendicular to the pleura. These are curly lines, uh, bigger lines emanating from the hilum, curly A lines. They are seen in acute congestive heart failure, and this is severe interstitial edema, and this is now alveolar edema when the pressure now exceeds 35 millimeters mercury. So when you are following up critical films or ICU films, these are the things that you have to look for. Clarity of the vessel margin. Number two, peribronchial coughing. Number three, change in the lucency of the blood vessel. And then number four, visibility of the subsegmental blood vessels. For you to obje objectively assess the progression or regression of the findings of pulmonary congestion or interstitial edema. So just not just by eyeballing it, but look at the four uh, radiographic criteria. So high learning, because this is before treatment. After treatment, you will see that the high learning is clear. Without <coughs> this is peribronchial coughing. With uh, treatment, you will see that the bronch there is less. This is perivascular haziness. With treatment, you will see more blood vessels. Uh, severe edema, peribronchial coughing, with, uh, with, clearing, uh, with clearing, you would see it clearly. And then you don't see the blood vessel, and now with clearing, you would see the margins of the blood vessels. How about systemic circulation? How do we assess systemic circulation on the bedside? Jugular venous pulse, carotid pulse, peripheral pulse. But <clears throat> wait a minute. <clears throat> the, jugular venous, uh, the jugular venous pulse is more remote from the heart. But when you look at the chest radiograph, you can see the SVC. It's more proximate to the heart. And by looking at the SVC, by looking at the aorta, by looking at the left subclavian artery, you can assess systemic circulation using the chest radiograph. And this is what we call vascular pedicle width. And what is the vascular pedicle width? It has a venous side. That's where your SVC would cross the right main bronchus. It has an arterial side that is where the left subclavian artery will take off from the aortic arts. This is the way to measure it, midline, and take note of where the SVC would cross the right main bronchus, and then from the midline to the point of crossing it, that is the right side of measurement. And then look at the left side, look at the aortic knob, and then take note where the left subclavian arises from it, and then measure that side, that is the arterial side, and the combined measurement of the two is called the vascular pedicle width. Let's <coughs> take a look at what would, uh, what, would, uh, what, uh, what would affect the vascular pedicle width. The venous side, that is the SVC, that is the right atrium, that is the RV. As I have more blood returning into my SVC, I have more circulating blood, I would expect that the SVC will be more prominent on the right side, and therefore my vascular pedicle will be, will be more prominent on the right side. If I have less, my SVC will be less conspicuous, and therefore my BPW on the right side will be more narrow. If I have high pressure in my right atrium, it will be reflected up into my SVC, it will be more prominent. If I have RV dysfunction, high RV pressure, it will be reflected up into my SVC, and my SVC will distend. If I have tricuspid rigors or tricuspid stenosis, it will be reflected up into the SVC. How about the arterial side? If I have more blood returning to my left atrium, I have more blood into my LV, I have more blood out of my aorta, I have more blood out of my left subclavian artery, and therefore my vascular pedicle width on the left side will be more prominent. On the other side, 
if I have hypotension or volume depletion, I have less blood going to my LA, less blood going to my LV, less blood into the aorta, less blood in the left subclavian artery, and therefore my left subclavian artery is less conspicuous on the left side. Let's take a look at the validation study. If you are interested, this is an old publication, 1984 radiology. <clears throat> you see in here, as you correlate the vascular pedicle width and the total blood volume, there's a linear relationship between the two. The R value is about 0.93. It's a high correlation value. And also, if you correlate the VPW and the mean right atrial pressure, there's also a linear correlation. But its correlation with volume is better than correlation with pressure. It's, so it's a better measurement of pressure, oh, the <coughs> volume rather than pressure within the right side of the heart. And then to validate that further, when they correlated a vascular pedicle width and pulmonary blood volume, there was no correlation between the vascular pedicle width and the pulmonary blood, blood volume, and therefore it is a valid way of assessing the systemic circulation. And not only that, when they correlated the changes in total blood volume and the vascular ped pedicle with changes, they were able to come up with this graph that for every one cm change in the vascular pedicle with this a corresponding almost two liter change in the fluid balance in the total blood volume. And when they subtracted the pulmonary blood volume from the total blood volume, so this will give you a systemic blood volume, again, you would see a good correlation. When you drop a line from here, for every one cm change in your vascular pedicle width, there's a more than one liter change in your systemic blood volume. This is the best evidence on the utility of vascular pedicle width as a measure of volume overload. It is a systematic review of eight studies with a total aggregate population of 363. In a supine film, if the vascular pedicle width is 71 millimeters or more, that is evidence of volume overload. The correlation value is moderate at 0.81. In an erect film, the cutoff value is 62 millimeters. If you have 62 or higher in an erect film, that is evidence of volume overload. And a moderate R value of 0 0.80. Another study, you would see in here that similar to the previous study, Regardless of the presence or absence of pulmonary edema, the best vascular pedicle with cutoff for differentiating high to normal or low intravascular volume is 70 millimeters. Patients with a vascular pedicle width of more than 70 coupled with a CT ratio of 0.55 is three times more likely to have a PCWP of more than 18. Yes? Is this affected by patients for dating? Of course. <clears throat> of course. So if you have to correlate it in a serial film, that, that, that there should be similar technical factors. And then when vascular pedicle width were correlated with the type of edema, you would see in here that the vascular pedicle width is significantly larger in renal edema with a p-value of less than 0 0.001, and also with cardiac edema with a p-value of less than 0 0.01. You would see that uh, ARDS, or injury edema, there's a preponderance of normal or even narrowed vascular pedicle width. Remember that there's no, there no volume overload in, vascular, in ARDS. It's more of direct injury into the capillary alveolar unit as the cause of the edema. This is very interesting because we have a lot of burn patient in here. They were able to show in here that those burn patient who would later on develop pulmonary edema, they were able to show that there are changes in the vascular pedicle width. Of course, you can argue there's overlap, but there's a trend in here that those group with pulmonary edema, burn patient, they have, they showed change in the vascular pedicle width. And in here, you would see that out of the 13, 12 out of them, only one did not show change in the vascular pedicle width. As opposed to the no edema group, you would see most of them did not show increase in VPW. Some of them showed even decrease in the vascular pedicle width. How about fluid balance? It has been shown that temporal changes in fluid balance in critically ill patient correlates with the vascular pedicle width. Fluid intake correlates with VP, changes in VPW. Changes in weight correlates with VPW. And not only that, there is higher correlation with changes in PCWP when they correlated with 
the swan guns monitor. And in with changes, you would see you could plot the changes in fluid balance in addition to your fluid intake, in addition to your changes in weight, in addition to your swan guns monitor. This is the effect of the supine film. You would see in here, this is the upright film. If the supine film, there's widening of the right side, there's also widening of the left side. That's the reason why you have different cutoff for supine, a different cutoff for upright film. This is somebody with unstable uh, angina. You would see in the baseline, that is the VPW on the right side. With, uh, with chest pain in the ED, you would see widening of the venous side as well as widening of the left side, meaning even in the absence of pulmonary edema, you could surmise that this patient is now retaining water. There is no evidence of increasing your systemic blood volume. And this one, uh, donated blood, you would see before the donation of the blood, the vascular pedicle with 62.5. After donation of the blood, you would see that the vascular pedicle will decrease to 60 millimeters. And then this is somebody with chronic renal insufficiency. This is after dialysis. You would see the vascular pedicle width is widened, but not very widened. And this is before the second session of dialysis. You would see that there is already evidence of volume overload, venous side as well as <coughs> the arterial side. And what is this? Somebody with profound dehydration, somebody with profound hypotension, Addison's crisis. You would see that the heart is small. You would see that the vascular pedicle width is narrow. You would see that the lung markings are very deficient, meaning there is deficiency of pulmonary blood volume as well as deficiency of systemic blood volume. Upon hydration, you would see that the heart became normal in size. And not only that, you would see that the vascular pedicle width now is more wide compared to the initial side before hydration. And not only that, you would see evidence of a shadow of the SVC on the right side. And you would see more replenishment of the blood flow in the lungs. You would see more markings of, in the lungs in here, you could hardly see a marking, and now you're beginning to see some markings in the inner as well as in the middle lung zone, much more so on the left side. Okay. This is somebody with uh, congestive heart failure. With chronicity, you would see widening of the vascular pedicle with, with sodium retention, with uh, overload. You would see corresponding widening of the vascular pedicle width. And what is this one? It is a combination of widened venous side of the vascular pedicle width, but the arterial side is narrow. Can you think of a particular hemodynamic abnormality resulting to a high venous side and a low output from the left side? It's pericardial tamponade. Venous side, pressure is high in the venous side, you will see ven uh, venous distension. That's the, your, your bedside clinical, clinical equivalent. And at the same time, there is hypotension. At the same time, you could see uh, there is uh, you could, uh, you could you could barely feel the pulse because there is restrictive feeling of the heart. There is less output coming from the left side. There is buildup on the right side, high pressure on the right side. So a combination of widening on the right side, narrowing on the left side. It's equivalent to somebody with pericardial tamponade. And you would see that the markings on the lungs are also deficient, more on the depleted side, hypovolemia. Okay. How about systemic extravascular lung water? So this is somebody with SLE for illustration. Baseline, you would see that <clears throat> at the time that there's full-blown uh, renal insufficiency, you would see there is widening of the vascular pedicle width. Not only that, you would see there is increase in the pulmonary blood volume. And not only that, you would see interstitial edema. And not only that, when you look at the soft tissue, there is thickening of the soft tissue at the chest wall, equivalent to Anasarca. You could also see that by, by plain film. So not only that, you could see the four compartments, uh, the fluid compartments in the body. The pulmonary, you could see the intravascular pulmonary blood volume. You can see extravascular lung water. Systemic, you can see intravascular using the vascular pedicle with an extravascular by measuring the chest changes in the chest wall thickness, edema in the soft tissue. So application time, interstitial edema, lower lung zone, a distribution of blood flow into the upper lung zone, the vascular pedicle width is slightly widened. What is the most likely hemodynamic abnormality caused by this one? Acute left heart failure. How about this one? 
full blown edema, central distribution. And you see that the vascular pedicle width is narrow, it's not widened. What is the cause of this one? It's caused by acute left heart failure with abrupt decompensation. Be because with abrupt decompensation, most of the edema fluid, most of the edema goes into the lungs. So much so that the systemic blood volume is depleted. That's the reason why this is, what, this is the equivalent of cardiogenic shock. You will see that the vascular pedicle is narrow because everything goes into the lungs. Most of it goes into the lungs. And your systemic blood volume is depleted. This is equivalent to high PCWP and low cardiac output. And what are the causes of this one? One is acute MR caused by papillary dysfunction in MI or acute aortic regards caused by infective endocarditis. So they will cause abrupt decompensation in the left heart, hemodynamics. And then about this one, redistribution of blood flow, gravitational distribution of edema fluid, and then a widened vascular pedicle width. This is consistent with water retention, pulmonary venous hypertension. It's more consistent with chronic left heart failure. And we saw this a while ago, when you see widening on the left side, narrowing on the left side, it's <coughs> consistent with pericardial tamponade. Application time, this is a postoperative Marfan's, what do we see? You look at the vascular pedicle with this widen here, the SVC, but look at, look at the take of the left circulation, it, it, you, can, you, you, can, you, you cannot see it. So there's widening on the right side, but inconspicuous on the left side, so meaning What's happening to this one, postoperative Marfan's? They did an interposition graph in the ascending aorta in an uh, aortic valve replacement. Can you make a guess before we look at the CT scan? Yes. Look at the fluid surrounding it. There was blood. And that's the reason why you see the density is the SBC, distended SBC. And you will see that the left subclavian artery is regressing towards the midline, so it's underfilled. And what is the cause? Anastomotic leak at the area of the, the graph. Postoperative evacuation, you will see the changes. You will see now there's less widening on the right side. You could see now the takeoff of the left subclavian artery on the left side. So we go now to integration of clinical and radiographic findings. Does this patient have heart failure? So do not take the chest radiograph in isolation. So you have to correlate it with whatever clinical data you have. I would like to uh, teach this way, the, uh, the, this one, Boston criteria. This is the, there are a lot of criteria for congestive heart failure, but I think this is one that we can make use of. You don't need other, other things except for history physical examination in the chest radiograph, because it's routine for us to take, to take a chest radiograph for almost everyone. In the history, this not rest, give, a, uh, give four points, PND, three points, or top knot, four points, and the chest radiograph, alveolar edema, you give four points, interstitial edema, you give three, bilateral pleural effusion, you give a point of three, C to ratio more than 0.5, three, careless A lines, two, then the, <coughs> the physical exam, heart rate, the jugular venous distension, the measurement, we used to do that bedside, pulmonary rolls, whizzing, and gallop is given a high point, S3 gallop is given a high point. If had a score of eight or more, congestive heart failure is uh, more likely, highly likely, but if the, um, if the score is four or fewer, then it's unlikely. Sensitivity is quite high, 90%. Specificity is about moderately high, about 85%. So with the sensitivity of 90%, what does this mean? We have a false negative rate of 10%, uh, specificity of 85% with a false positive rate of 15%. So it's good enough. So is it, is it good enough? Yes, 90% sensitivity, specificity 85, positive predictive value is 86%, negative predictive value is, is, is better, it's more in ruling, ruling out rather than in ruling in, uh, about 90%. And a total accuracy of 87.5%. And then, how do we compare Boston criteria side by side with BNP? Yeah, we were dependent on BNP, we were dependent on 2 Diego. But even here, you're using the, 
just using the Boston criteria, you would see that it could stand among the giants in left heart failure. Uh, Boston criteria is 86%. With BNP, uh, it's even lower, 83%. With an uh, ejection fraction of less than 50%, it's even a lower performance in terms of sensitivity. And uh, Doppler analysis of the mitral valve uh, sensitivity of 82%. So in comparison with 2D, uh, with 2D echo and uh, BNP, you would see that in terms of sensitivity, the sensitivity of the Boston criteria is comparable. But, but its weakness and its specificity. Specificity is only 51%. It is head-to-head head comparison with BNP and 2D echo. But of course, with the Doppler, you would see that the specificity is 90%. It's more in ruling out. Remember, snout, a sensitive test rules out. Spin, a specific test rules in. So remember, snout and spin. <coughs> so <coughs> positive predictive value for edema, redistribution, effusion, it's moderately high, about, about, about 70%. But this is the uh, evidence base that I would like to show to you regarding the chest radiograph, a systematic review of 22 studies. When you look at pulmonary venous congestion, the one we outlined a while ago in the chest radiograph, the pool posit uh, positive black fluid ratio is 12. This is quite high. The threshold is 10, but the negative uh, black fluid ratio is, is just moderately low because the threshold for this should be 0.1. So, but it's good enough for ruling in because the pool positive, uh, pool positive black fluid ratio is 12%. Much more so, with, uh, similar to the interstitial edema, also a full positive, uh, positive black fluid ratio of 12%, but with alveolar edema, because it's less specific, why? It could, it, it, could, it, could be, it, it could be simulated by pneumonia, because a lot of patients with congestive failure have concomitant pneumonia, especially those already long staying in the hospital, they develop hospital acquired pneumonia, so it should, not be, it should be less specific than interstitial and pulmonary venous congestion. Also, cardiomegaly is non specific, so the positive uh, likelihood ratio is 3.3, .3, and the presence of pleural effusion is also non specific, and so, so we'd expect that the pool positive likelihood ratio is only 3.2. Another study based on a cohort of a large population, 880 and seven teaching hospitals, uh, about half of them had a final diagnosis of heart failure. You would see in here that in, among <coughs> Among the radiographic findings, all of them showed, uh, the ones showing high specificity is interstitial edema and cephalization of blood flow, 96%. Similar to the system, uh, <coughs> systematic review, the positive black fluid ratio is also high, 12.7, and about 10 for cephalization of blood flow. Expect that cardiomegaly, specificity and sensitivity are moderately high, and positive black fluid ratio is low at <coughs> 3.98. Based on a systematic review of 11 studies, they have found out that blood flow distribution is, spe is, specific, is specific but not sensitive. Specificity ranges from 79 to 100%, but sensitivity could be lost 10%, and the, the best scenario is 58%. Other studies, 11 studies, you would see in here that radiographic redistribution and presence of jugular venous distension would suggest increased feeling pressure. Uh, radiographic cardiomegaly or redistribution or LBB or abnormal apical pulse suggests ejection fraction of less than 40% and the presence of hypertension would suggest diastolic dysfunction. Redistribu absence of radiographic cardiomegaly or redistribution rule out ejection fraction that is less than 40% based on a systematic review of 12 studies. Specificity is high, 87 to 100% but sensitivity is very low, 4 to 33 percent. And then <coughs> CT ratio might not accurately identify left ventricle ejection fraction. That's very true. How about Doppler and BNP? You would see in here that side-by-side -side comparison between Doppler and BNP, you would see that uh, the specificity and sensitivity of 2D echo Doppler is better than BNP. And positive black load ratio is better with 2D echo compared to BNP, as well as the negative black load ratio. Just extra findings. Again, this is a last review by Health Technology Assessment, a publication in 2095 studies. You would see in here that chest X-ray and any abnormality related to heart failure, sensitivity of 68%. 
specificity of 83%, so it's moderately high specificity, uh, a rate of uh, false positive rate of 17%. Increased CT ratio, uh, so it's a specificity of 76%. Expect that because there, are, there could be a heart failure without cardiac enlargement or a non-heart non failure with cardiomegaly. This is a proposal in 2011 uh, <coughs> combining physical examination and BNP. I will not go through all the, the parameters, but you can, you can look at this publication. They, <coughs> they give the points based on the age, based on the history, based on the use of diuretics, based on the displacement of the apex, based on the presence of RALS, irregularity of the pulse, and then the, uh, the levels of the corresponding levels of the BNP. And they, they came up with a scoring system. If the score is less than 13, there's less than 10% probability of heart failure. If the score is more than 63, there's a more than 80% probability of heart failure. Does this NIC patient have congestive heart failure? So <clears throat> you're in the ED, somebody come, come, come with dyspnea, and your question now, is this patient uh, suffering from congestive heart failure. Which of, the, which of the parameters would increase probability of heart failure? From this systematic review, 22 studies, they found out that among this, past history of heart failure, PND, uh, S3 Gallup, EKG findings of atrial fib, but among this, the chest X-ray outperforms the rest. You would see that the likelihood rate is 12. And similarly, what uh, which among these factors would decrease the probability of heart failure against absence of cardiomegaly with the least, uh, uh, least level of negative likelihood ratio? It's better than the EKG, better than physical examination of RALS or history of heart failure or dyspnea and exertion. But in terms of ruling out, BNP outperforms all of them. If we have a BNP that's less, one, less than 100 uh, picogram per ml, the negative likelihood ratio is 0.11. So you might question me what I'm talking about, the likelihood ratio. So if I have a likelihood ratio, increasing likelihood ratio will impact your diagnosis, meaning the probability increases. And the cutoff is that if I have a likelihood ratio of more than 10, I have a strong positive test result. Then if I have decreasing uh, likelihood ratio, I have I am decreasing my probability of having that disease. And the cutoff is that if I have a likelihood ratio of less than 0.1, it is a strong negative test. Let's take a look at the Fagan nomogram. This is, <coughs> this is now the, uh, if you are familiar with the JAMA, the JAMA evidence-based medicine, they, they, they use this a lot, uh, estimation of probability. It calls the Fagan nomogram. You have a pretest probability and then that's the reason why I'm discussing with you likelihood ratio. You can comp we can compete for the probability of that the presence of the disease by taking note of the likelihood ratio, and then you can calculate what is the final probability of having that disease. I will give you an example now. Somebody in the emergency room, probably a newcomer in the emergency room, complaining of dyspnea. Even without doing anything, the probability of having congestive heart failure is already 8.9%. That's what you call the prevalence of congestive heart failure, somebody coming to the ED complaining of dyspnea. Even before I lay down my stethoscope on him or even doing my interview, I know that the probability of congestive heart failure is about 8.9%. That's what you call pretest probability. And now I'm now doing my examination. And I did, uh, I did a chest radiograph as part of my routine. It's always almost automatic for us, a knee jerk, knee -jerk reflex or <clears throat> chest x-ray. And I know from the previous, previous evidence base that my likelihood rate is 12. So I, I, I plot it now, my pretest probability is 8.9%. My positive likelihood rate is 12. And I plot a line and now I come up with a post-test probability of more than 60%. How about somebody with S3 Gallup? My likelihood ratio is 11. My pretest probability is 8.9%. And when I plot it, I already have a 58% probability of having the disease, congestive heart failure. Somebody with just an S3 Gallup. 
And now I'm trying to combine my chest radiograph. My patient now is presenting with S3 Gallup. I have a pretest probability of 58%. And now my chest radiograph is showing pulmonary venous congestion. And now I come up with a pretest probability of a post-test probability of 95%. Somebody with a pulmonary venous congestion, somebody with S3 Gallup, my probability of having congestive heart failure is now 95%. How about absence of cardiomegaly? Somebody coming to the emergency room complaining of dyspnea. I have a pretest probability of 8.9%, but my chest radiograph was negative for cardiomegaly, and therefore my uh, likelihood ratio is 0.33, and therefore there is a drop from my initial pretest probability of 9% to just 2%, and therefore I can drop my diagnosis and look for other causes of dyspnea. So this is what occurs in our mind. This is a graphical depiction of what, what happens in the mind of a doctor. We call it the treatment threshold and the, and the test threshold. At what point will you commence treatment? 95% probability or 90% probability? At what point will you drop your initial diagnosis, 5% or 4%? This is just a graphical representation of what occurs in a doctor's mind. And the way to do it is making use of likelihood ratio. You should have a, you, yeah, yeah, you should have a, a pocket of all the li likelihood ratio of the common things that you see, and you can calculate for the probability of having that disease. But this is a caveat to this. There are no signs of congestion in the chest X-ray of patients with decompensated with heart failure in the ED in about. 18.7%, and I think partly due to diagnostic log of 12 hours. I think that's the last slide. <clears throat> Any question? <clears throat> 